Welcome to Save the Track Bike. I'm your host, Josh. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. Today's is super exciting. If you have listened to a lot of the episodes, you know that I kind of started riding fixed gear bikes around 2007. And yeah, it's just always been my favorite kind of bike to ride, all that kind of stuff. But along with like whenever I started, one of the big influences on me were like videos and stuff, and specifically of Mesh. So I'm super stoked today to have Chaz Christensen. He rides with Mesh. Yeah, I don't know. We just talk about a lot of stuff from Mission Crit, which, by the way, just announced their date. So Mission Crit is happening April 21st. Registration opens on March 2nd. So, yeah, hit that up. But, yeah, Chaz was really rad. I emailed Mesh, and I was like, hey, I'd love to have Chaz on. And he emailed me the next day, and we set up a time in a couple of days. And he's just a super down-to-earth dude, really, really nice. And we talk about everything from, like I said, Mission Crit, all the way to his art, all the way to the kit that he just collaborated on with Mesh. We get into some of the new Mesh projects as far as their frames this summer, and it's rad. One of my favorite parts was talking about the... Uh, going to Japan and seeing the Kieran school. So yeah, it's a fucking cool episode. So we're just going to get into it. Check it out. Here it goes. Cool. I'm here with uh, Chaz Christensen. Um, of MASH and all kinds of other things. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, yeah. I'm Chaz. Hello, everyone. Chaz Christensen. Uh, I live in, actually live in Oakland. Just moved to Oakland from San Francisco last week. So new Oakland resident, but I uh, live in the Bay Area and ride track bikes. and doing it for quite a long time. Do a bunch of other cool stuff. Yeah. Do you want to talk about how you got into cycling and, and how you got into fixed gear cycling specifically? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I rode bikes my entire life you know i had a bmx bike when i was a kid i rode a mountain bike to uh school uh but then you know i got a car when i was like leaving high school like everybody else pretty much and uh i drove it really fast i drove lots of cars very fast uh for a long time i never got into any accidents into any accidents never got a dui but i did get uh 22 moving violations in two years so the state of washington took my license away when i was very young i think i want to say i was like 20 uh, and so I didn't have a license and I, I was living in Portland, Oregon at the time and Portland's super bike friendly. And I had a cyclocross bike and started racing cyclocross. And so I kind of just started, you know, commuting by bike and getting around everywhere like that. And, uh, I noticed all these guys riding these crazy bikes that didn't stop pedaling and kind of didn't really get it until I met the messengers at a cross race and they were racing uh fixed cross. Um, and it was just like, that kind of blew my mind. I was like, wait, you ride in the dirt on bikes with no brakes and, so I, you know, met them and then they were like, you know, we hang out at the Ash Street Saloon and whatever. So I started hanging out at the local messenger bar. And uh, at that point, I was living way out in Southeast Portland at this crazy house. And uh, I put together my first track bike, not even a track bike, uh, Pixie, really, because it was an old road frame. And my friend, Ariel, gave me one of those suicide wheels. Oh, yeah. One of the wheels that is not actually a track hub, you know, but an old freewheel that you spin a cog onto, put a lock ring bottom bracket on, and then like really torque it down and hope for the best. So <laughs> that's kind of how I started. I, you know, I was racing that. It was like a 52 Peugeot conversion uh, with that suicide wheel on the back. Um, and yeah, I just started racing Alley Cats in Portland. It was like, you know, I just thought it was a cool thing to do on Friday nights. The first winter, there was a, a series of races called, uh, I think, like Dash for Cash, the Cash Money Series. So every Friday for like five weeks in a row, there was a race where the winner took all. And I never, you know, won any money, but I... Uh, I like rode on the freeway for the first time and like, you know, did all, basically started to race an alley cats and was just like blown away. Kind of got hooked after that. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so what attracted you to fix gear in general? Like what was it about it that you liked? Really skating was like super cool. You know, that was like, <laughs> I was super into snowboarding and you know, I was like, Oh, skating a track bike is just like carving a snowboard. So it kind of just made sense to me. It was just like something new. Like I rode bikes, you know, but then it was like this new thing to learn how to do. Yeah, for sure. I kind of think the same similar thing attracted me to it just because I had a history of BMX and like all that stuff that like just being able to do something different that was, um, yeah, I don't know, just so simple, but also just different and fun. But yeah. 
Uh, so part of that is like when I first got into fixed gear bikes was kind of like 2007 ish, just at that time, like mash was like a huge inspiration to everybody that was riding out here in Denver. And like, I'm sure like all over the place. So I kind of just want to get into how you got involved with mash and, and like how that all came about. Yeah. I mean, it's actually funny is that I, when I was living in Portland, I thought that MASH was really stupid. You know, like when MASH first came out, I was working as a messenger, and I was like, who are these jokers? Like, those aren't real messengers. You know, it's kind of one of those things where you're just like, oh, that's dumb because I'm not a part of it. You know, and I, <laughs> you know, I won a couple, like MASH sponsored a couple races, and I won a couple races in Portland, but it ultimately was kind of like, yeah, whatever, you know, like whatever. You know, and then I moved to San Francisco, and – uh MASH was there, you know, but a lot of the messengers that were a part of MASH were like the older messengers, and I was only like three years deep, so I was totally a rookie, and, you know, they all kind of made fun of me, and they weren't like total dicks, but a lot of them were like kind of just, you know, normal messenger dicks, and it was just like, <laughs> oh, man, like, all right, cool, whatever, and then, um, you know, it was right about the time that they came out with uh, that, the first bolt frame mm-hmm. with Chinelli, and that was like, I, I, had, I was riding a Cannondale track at the time. And I, I loved that bike, but I was like, all right, well, this bolt frame is like super cool. It's very interesting, you know, and it wasn't released yet. There was a couple photos and a couple magazines. But then every year, uh, MASH would throw a Breakers to Bay Race, which is uh, kind of a counterpart to the Beta Breakers Marathon in San Francisco. It's like a marathon or a run that goes all the way across the city. You know, 30,000 people come and do it. It's like this crazy event every year. Uh, but Breakers to Bay started at the same time, but went opposite direction. And basically, it made you cross the path of the marathon like three times the checkpoints you know like took you in a zigzag and you started in the ocean and finished on the bay and then beta breakers started in the bay and finished in the ocean so you're kind of riding against like 30,000 people <laughs> um, and the prize was uh one of those mash frames and they were it was a prototype because they had gotten like 10 prototypes and it was like oh whoa like okay well even i remember waking up the morning of that race being like i don't really want to go do this like whatever i got nothing better to do like i'm not even gonna put on socks today you know i'm just gonna go throw on my bike shoes and like didn't even bring a helmet, you know, just kind of like rode out there and was like, all right, we'll see what happens. Um, ended up winning the race and winning the frame. Uh, and even then I was like, oh, that's cool. But like mash still kind of a joke, like whatever, this frame is tight, but I've already got a frame. Like, man, this is like a prototype. I wonder if I could sell it on the internet for like tons of money, you know? So I was like, it's a messenger just like trying to, trying to get a quick buck yeah. at the time. And then Mike from mash reached out and was like, Hey, congratulations. Like, let me know if you need any more support. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And he's like, well, I don't know, like whatever you need. Like I can get you a deal on some cranks. They can maybe get you some wheels. I can get you a kit. Like, let me know if you need anything to help you like ride harder or like whatever. And I was just kind of like blown away by that. I was like, wait, you want to just help me? Like why? And he was just like, I don't know. That's what we do. Like we help people like ride bikes fast. I'm like, you know, you're fast and like, we'll down to support you. So kind of from that, you know, he gave me my first kit. Um, I remember like meeting up with Gabe Morford in front of deluxe and getting a kit from Gabe and was like, Oh my God, you're Gabe Morford. And I'm in front of Deluxe and you're handing me like a cycling kit, you know, and then kind of from that started riding with a lot of the guys from MASH. Like I had raced with Rainier a bunch in the East Bay. I had known Walton from back in Portland, but then MASH kind of just brought us all together. So I think it was like a good timing of like coming together with a crew that was kind of about going fast. You know, we, we started training, you know, we would go out and training rides and like, you know, originally it was like throw on some jean shorts and a t-shirt and go ride your track bike. But then we started to get road bikes and wear kits and like, get faster and mike was always just there as like uh you know can i help support you and you know maybe introducing us as someone that's down to fly us somewhere if he had somebody like splitting the cost of a plane ticket to go to an event like just kind of being supportive so it really actually just kind of happened it wasn't like a definitive thing where it was like you're on the team and this is a team because it wasn't even a team at that point it was just mike and gabe running it out of mike's garage you know, and yeah. it was just kind of like they were just trying to support people. And like, you know, they do, they want to go out and film every once in a while, which was like super cool. Filming was, you know, filming with the scooter is like such a rush. It's so much fun to do that. You push yourself. So kind of just a lot of different things. But ultimately, it was just like Mike offered a lot of support. And that was like really weird to me, but like totally a positive thing, you know? Yeah. So I never thought about riding a bike as anything other than like making money and racing on the weekends. So it was cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, one of my favorite videos is just, uh, I think it's like one that you're in, and then uh, it's like the pace line one, where you guys are just like behind the scooter. It's like such a simple yeah, video, yeah. but it's just so, it just fucking makes me want to go ride really fast. So <laughs> that that is that is actually the point. I mean, that's really what, MASH just kind of became something where we were like, wow, like people pay attention to us. That's crazy. You know, like, wow, we should, we should really stoke people out and like, 
we're really excited to ride bikes with our friends. We should get other people that excited to ride bikes with their friends. So it's like ultimately the goal of MASH is to get people excited to go ride bikes and like do what we do. You have fun, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. And then it kind of just turned into like now it's like this whole brand almost where uh, you guys have like the bikes with Chinelli and like all that stuff. Uh, And I think that's super rad. And I do want to talk a little bit about the kit that you guys, that you designed. Um, Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, man, I'm, I'm super pumped on that. I mean, I, I've been, been it's really fucking cool. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, it's like, so I'm super excited about the kit. It's been like a fruit, uh, like a, the fruition of like a lot of work on my part and just kind of like this ultimate vision I've had because I've drawn on, you know, pretty much everything I can get my hands on frames, you know, rims, helmets, shoes. I did some caps. I did some socks. I did some gloves, like kind of done everything but a kit, you know, but I do everything analog. I don't use Photoshop. I don't do anything like that. I just draw on like whatever I get my hands on. So a kit was always really hard because I know from working with other people to help design like the TCB kit and working with MASH that it's, that it's like you need Photoshop, you need to have templates, you need to have all this stuff that was like above my head but also not anything I'm super interested in. You know, I'm not, I don't want to teach myself Photoshop so I can design a kit. But uh, I'd worked with Bobby Endo um, at Endo Customs in LA for a long time. He always produced all the TCB kits uh, for the race teams for like five years. Super nice guy fun to party with. Uh, he supports a really rad team that I'm really good friends with all the dudes. So it's kind of just one of those, like you're a really good friend and you run a really cool business. And I really like his business model too. You know, he keeps it really small. He does not trying to get huge. He's just trying to create like a really quality product. So we've been talking back and forth about making a kit, but I was still kind of at a roadblock. And then I, uh, I did this project with zip last year where they wanted to kind of emphasize the capabilities of their new impress impression printing technology to print on rims on the dimpled like 404 rims. Yeah. And they wanted me to design some wheels and the the guy zip was like, all right, send me the the vector file when you're done. And I was like, Oh man, I don't, I don't do that. (laughs) So I got them to basically send out the full sized rim, like print template, like exactly the size of the rim and everything, like what they would use And he was kind of dubious about it, but I was like, trust me, if it's full size, it'll lay down perfectly. So I drew on it, scanned it, sent it to him, and he hit me back like an hour later and was like, oh, yeah, if it's perfect, drops right in. So I, you know, had these rad wheels made that look super cool, but I was like, oh, man, like, why don't I do something like that for the kit? And so I talked with Bobby, and I feel like that wouldn't work necessarily with like a big kit company, you know, but since Bobby's super small and is just kind of down for fun projects, he's like, yeah, I'll print out the kit template full sized and send it to you. So like, you know, a couple months later or a couple weeks later, I got this huge roll and it's every piece of the kit. Like, cause it's, I don't know. I think the Jersey is something like 10 pieces, 10 different, you know, fabric swatches, the bib the same way, like everything's individual and then it gets sewn together. Uh, and he sent them out full size. And so then I just drew on all of the pieces individually, you know, full size and everything. And it took, I don't even know, like a couple months, you know, working on it. Um, and then finally, when I got them all done, I scanned them all and sent them to Bobby, and he, you know, kind of put it together, packed, pieced piece it all together, which took him a long time. He's he's a champion for that. Uh, but basically, it's like a hand drawn kit. Like it's the, in essence, I I drew on the kit full, you know, like just like I would be if someone is wearing it, and I drew on like a mannequin. So it's super cool to see my art kind of presented in that capacity. But it's also rad to have the kit because I, you know, I've had this in my head for years and years and years and then to see it it's like oh man that is like really really fucking cool (laughs) yeah it is and it i think it just works so well like the artwork just in that format i don't know like most kits i think are kind of i don't know not very attractive but like mash always does a good job but the that one is just like one of my favorite Mm -hmm. ones i've seen so I, i definitely wanted to shout that out and this will be coming out in like a week so it should still be up for pre order, right? Yeah, it'd be cool for people to, to know about it. I mean, I'm going to do a little video project that kind of outlines that. You know, I have all of the original, like, kit pieces and everything. But, yeah, I'd be stoked to have it out there. I mean, it's I'm super proud of it. I think it looks rad. And I think it looks different, too, than, like, almost any other kit out there, which I think is super cool. Yeah, for sure. So I wanted to get into how, like, Red Hook and, like, all of that stuff came about and – is that something you're still planning on continuing doing? And yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think Red Hook is, is phenomenal. And I think that, you know, it's changed a lot. Everyone likes, oh, has good or bad things to say about Red Hook now, but 
I think the ultimate thing is change is an inevitable in life. And like, I was just really lucky to be a part of Red Hook kind of not at its very beginning. Cause I never took part in the actual like street races of Red Hook when they were in Red Hook for Trimble's birthday, which I'm actually really bummed about. Cause I had heard about him and kind of blew him off. And then I went <laughs> to the first sanctioned Red Hook. I think it was 2009, but the first year that it was actually like a legitimate event at the cruise ship terminal. And it was cool. Cause at that point, uh, you know, I just, I was in a road cycling and like, you know, been wearing a kit for a couple of years and was into cyclocross racing, but never really been one for road racing. And I just take this as a personal example, but it brought for me at least. And I think a lot of other people in my scenario, like street messengers, it really gave us an avenue to race with like professional people, you know, and like experience, like basically what a professional criterion would be like, because Red Hook is run so professionally. Dave Trimble is so passionate about it and so precise about how everything is run. And he attracts, more and more, but even back then in 2009, such a high caliber of athletes. You know, I was lining up next to guys that had domestic pro contracts, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm a pro cyclist. I ride my bike for money, and I deliver packages." You know, <laughs> and it's like, you know, it was super crazy because I would, I would never do that. I would never have the opportunity to line up against domestic pros and race against them because I don't have a license and I don't, you know, do that. But Red Hook was really brought everyone together. It brought people like me who raced the first three years in mountain bike pedals and mountain bike shoes. Cause that's what I was comfortable with. And, you know, we're like bike messengers next to people that are professional road racers in it. It gave us like a way to, to connect and be on the race, which was like fantastic. It was, it's more about the community, you know, like it's been the same core group of people for, for the first, like, you know, five or six years. And then, you know, as people slowly start to step away and other people step in, the community still grows. But I think ultimately if you ask, almost anyone about it that races, they're like, yeah, the race is super cool and whatever, but I really like seeing all my friends and the party's really important. And like, it's about the community. And it's a little bit strange to see the massive amount of sponsorship that it's gotten. Um, and it's gotten a little commercialized, but like I said, change is inevitable. And for David to pull it off in four different cities, um, you know, around the world every year, that takes a lot of, a lot of money, you know, it's like people want to have a crazy event with like all this live streaming and all these cameras and all this super high tech, you know, timing gear for the athletes and athlete areas. And it's like, well, that, you know, that costs money. Yeah. <laughs> I remember <laughs> when I first did it in 2009, he had one big room, a warehouse, like right across the street from the race course and everybody went in there and there was no athlete area. You just like set up some rollers in a corner or like everyone was milling around and there's huge piles of messenger bags and, you know, there was no timing chip and there was no like, you know, live feed or even like video projection and anything, you know? And so then you look now and there's crazy video projection, there's jumbotron, super high tech timing athlete areas. Like, you know, so it's, it's cool. I think for me, I don't know if I'm going to race many more of them, uh, to be honest, just cause the level of competition has gotten so big. You know, I think at this point to be competitive in a red hook, you need to be able to compete at like a pro domestic pro one, two crit, um, which, Fitness is a really challenging to get. It takes a lot of time and commitment to race in those, but also it's become like a really aggressive, uh, really aggressive race, which is really cool in some capacity. But I think at least for me getting a little older, it's, I'm not so much into like rubbing elbows with like three dudes at like, you know, 25 miles an hour around a hairpin or something. Yeah. Uh, but I think a lot of people are, and I think it's cool. And I think that like, you know, just cause I'm, getting a little older and may not be so into it. I think that if I had been presented with that opportunity five years ago, I would have been like, hell yeah, you know, this is sick. Um, it's just, you know, for me, it's just changed. But I think for a lot of people, it's still like a great entry and a lot of people are really excited. But I think the biggest positive takeaway is that it's inspired a culture. You know, when Red Hook started, there was no other fixed gear crits that I could think of. There was like maybe one or two and they were all super local. And, you know, it wasn't like a thing that people did. And now, especially in Europe, there's, a criterium every weekend there's multiple criteriums every weekend in different countries and there's series and even in america too like you know all over the world in southeast asia they're starting to happen like it's created this culture behind it where people are throwing these crits getting sponsorship money creating positive strong communities in their hometown and in their local community kind of with the goal of going to red hook you know people are doing these smaller races so they can train and practice and hopefully get ready to go to red hook so red hook set the bar really high i think but it's also given a lot of people an attainable goal to strive towards. And if you, someone has a goal, I feel like they're apt to work like so much harder. So, you know, I, I think ultimately Red Hook is still a fantastic event and I will probably end up racing Barcelona this year because it's the coolest Red Hook in my opinion, it's hard to beat. <laughs> uh, but it will probably be more for fun. Um, I mean, I race everything for fun, but I think it's hard 
for me sometimes to let go of the competitive aspect because as much as I, I race for fun, you know, I'm still a very competitive person when it comes down to it. And I think I, I'm going to start to realize, or I have started to realize over the last couple of years of like, wow, like the dudes that are up front, you know, they're actually like, they're really, really good at this. Whereas I'm like pretty good at this, you know? <laughs> and so <laughs> It's so different to come in and just be like, I just want to race and have fun and stay upright. Where in the, the first couple of years I was racing it, it was like, I got, I, mean, I got a third place. I used to win a preem every race. You know, I used to get top ten finishes all the time, and now it's like, you just qualifying for the main race is a big thing, and then finishing on the lead lap is huge. So it's tough for me personally because I, it was, I was so high up in it, but at the same time the race has changed so much that it's just like, you know, it's it's a, it's a struggle to come to terms with it, but it's also just kind of part of life. And it's, I think a lot of the people that. I started racing with that are still racing are having the same struggle. And we just kind of laugh about it, you know, yeah. when we meet up at Red Hook, cause it's like, Oh man, it's like the old fixie squad is here. <laughs> All the guys, like I remember in Brooklyn last year, I lined up with the, for the last chance race. Cause I didn't, it was the first time I hadn't qualified ever. And I was like crushed. I was like, couldn't even believe it. I was like, what the fuck? And I lined up, <laughs> And I, a last chance race, and I looked around, and everybody I was with was all the people that I lined up in the front row with like three years before. And we all had like a good laugh. We were like, oh, man, like is this what it's become? Like me and like 19 other dudes that I've been racing with forever, we were like, well, now we're in the last chance race. All right, well, let's have a good time and like go as fast as we can, you know? Yeah. So it's, I think it's still ultimately I think that the community that it's created and like the opportunity, the opportunities it's given athletes is like phenomenal, you know? For sure. Yeah, I think that's it's really interesting to see how it's changed and stuff. Uh, I just had Kira McVitie on, and and she was talking about how in one of the races, like Danny King came on, and she was like, yeah, yeah she just like lapped the field, and like everybody got pulled. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. It's just it's interesting, but it it is really cool because I do think that it makes an opportunity, like you were saying, for other races, like. Uh, mission crit or bone machine and all that kind yeah. of stuff to like drum up like that excitement as well and kind oh, of yeah. like uh, live off of that. Do you want to talk about those races uh, for a minute? Yeah, I mean, those are fantastic. I feel like those, I actually really enjoy racing those and sometimes have a chance of podiuming them. So I, I enjoy them a little <laughs> more. But I think that, you know, one of the things about Red Hook, and this is not only happening in America, you know, in, in there's like a huge crit series in Italy. There's a huge crit series yeah. in the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. So this is like bone machine and mission crit are cool, but this is like a phenomenon that's happening all over in the, in the Midwest. There's the intelligentsia cup, which is a four race series. Yep, yep. You know, it's just, it's super cool, but I think it's rad because red hook is expensive. If you're not on a team traveling and you know, if, you, if you're doing it by yourself and you're just going for it, you're looking at like a $3,000 investment for every Red Hook, if you think about it, or 2500 if you get cheap plane plates. If you think about everything like flights, baggage yeah. fees, lodging, food, and that's not even counting the time you spent training and your bike and everything. It's like it's a pretty expensive proposition. So these local races give people the opportunity to race and develop a skill set and then hopefully pick up some sponsorship or at least decide if they love this enough to invest the money themselves and do it. And then I think a, a good shout-out should go to the SoCal Crit Series down yeah. in the lake. they throw like 10 races and they do it pretty cutty like and they still pull it off and you know they have the the called the attacker race which mm-hmm. is the like newcomers and they, they they literally have a race it's just like if you're not comfortable racing with the big dudes like do this race if it's cool it's a little shorter get your sea legs and i feel like most of the time that i've raced those those that field's like way bigger so like 80 people in the attacker field and like 40 or 50 in the like you know the men's pro field they also have a super strong women's field as well so they like really pay attention to the community, but they also throw like very competitive, like legitimate crits. Maybe not 100% legitimate, but that kind of endears them to me. Um, you <laughs> yeah, know, if the course. cops, if the cops roll up every once in a while, though, they'll, they'll wave the checkered flag and cut the race a couple laps short to avoid <laughs> any problems. But, you know, and that's, but that's one of the things And it's, you know, they're learning and they're progressing and, you know, just how Kira was saying how Danny King came and they lapped the field. And that year, all the women were bummed. They were like, dude, we flew all the way out here and you literally pulled everybody. So next time that happened, Trimble basically made a rule that it's like she can lap the field, but I'm not pulling people. He pulls some people for safety, but if it's gotten down to a small enough group, he let I – think, I think that happened in a race the following year. He let the group continue uh, like you would in a road race. If somebody laps a field in a road crit, they don't cancel the crit. They just – they're like, oh, you won the race already, but you know, we're still going to race for the required number of laps. So, you know, I think it's important to recognize that throwing events is really hard. All of these crit organizers, whether it be Trimble at Red Hook or the guys that throw a SoCal crit or, you know, James Grady at Mission Crit, they're constantly striving to do the best they can. And if they do mess up or something happens, 
you know, they're nine times out of 10 going to be like, how can we do this better next time? So it's important not to get angry at crit organizers for things like that. Cause it's, you know, they're trying their best and they're doing it for the community, but that's how it progresses. And that's how, you know, we get better races is people screw up and then they fix it the next time. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the really first important. Crit was in a parking lot, you know, yeah. like James Grady threw a crit in a parking lot illegally with a bunch of caution tape, Sweet. you know, and then four years later, five years later, he's got this like badass sanctioned event, that, like totally rules. So, you know, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you know much about uh, the bone machine coming back? Are you going to race that? And Yeah, definitely. I mean, I raced the first one. It was super cool. I, I, I lived in Portland for a long time, so it's rad for me to like go back to kind of one of my hometowns and see all my friends and race. I was really excited about bone machine. Um, and I really, I really hope it comes back because I will 100% go and race it if, if it comes back again. Yeah, absolutely. I think that'll be sick. Um, but yeah, it's cool that you mentioned the fixation or the Intelligentsia Cup in the Midwest because I definitely plan on doing those. That'll be really fun. I'm stoked on They're that. Fun. I raced the uh, the Speed Week ones, and this is this happens all the time. Maybe not all the time, but it happens a lot in Europe where they do a lot of just road racing, like road criteria called Kermis racing, especially in the Netherlands and Belgium, on the Low Countries. Every weekend, it's just like a thing, you know. Everyone comes out, and you know, there's a bike race in your town, and they shut down some streets, and guys race, and they make some money, and it's not a ton of money, but there's always cash. And they've started, they started a couple of years back, adding these races into that race, like into the, into that race day. So you know, in between like the Masters 45 plus and the Masters 40, they'd be like, okay, the track bikes are going to go, and uh, it's super rad, and you know, the, the community is really behind it, and it really kind of opened up a lot of race events people that wouldn't be there and you know there's like 10 euro preems and like you know it's not you're not going to win like a frame but you know there's some cash prizes and uh it's a really good time because you're part of especially for new racers you're part of the scene and you understand what it's like to go and like warm up and get on rollers and you see how other because the best way to learn is watching other people i feel like so you see how everyone else handles themselves and you're like all right like this is how you do it and so the intelligentsia cup they do two races during a tour of Dairylands in uh milwaukee and so it's the same thing it's like the fixed gear crit races like right before the pro women's and right after like one of the masters races and they just you know throw you in and there's preems and you race on the same course as the guys on road bikes and girls on road bikes and i think that's super cool that they incorporate that into the race culture because i don't want i think it would be tough if fixed gear crits remain on the outside i think that they should it's better if everyone kind of comes in together and because that way it opens up a lot more doors and opportunities for people Absolutely. Yeah, we had our first uh, USA sanctioned crit in Denver last summer. Yeah, it was basically that. It was a road crit hosted by like this road team out here, and they added a fixed gear category, and they loved having everybody there. They were just like, "Oh, you guys don't complain," and like, <laughs> just because yeah, we're just excited to be there. We're just like, yeah. we just love this. Like. Yeah, exactly. They were just like, "Yeah, you guys are just so laid back." It was pretty cool. Yeah, it was awesome. More Hold on of that. one second. Someone's yeah. ringing my doorbell. Give me one second. Can I help you? Is this car belonging to anybody? Yeah. It's rolling backwards. Oh, it is. Party. It's mine. Hey, I got to call you back in like 30 seconds. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, but it is rolling backwards. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you so much. No, yeah, and that's a bad intersection. Damn. No, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. I was like, I'm the can you hear me yeah sorry about that my fucking car the e-brake is like not that great and it started to slip down the street oh, no. so my, neighbor, my neighbor was like your car <laughs> oh shit oh that's funny but also good thing like, your car yeah, didn't go car. to the intersection <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right. So, um, one of my listeners, uh, asked me to reach out and interview you. 
And one of the things he wanted me to ask about is something about Japan, but I don't know anything about it. So <laughs> ask away. I no, I don't know about Japan. So was there something like a mash in Japan or something like that? Um, I mean, yeah, we went to Japan and we went and took part in the track party 2017, which was on the, this was in, uh, November of last year. I want to say it was on the, we went, got a ride on the, the Izu velodrome. Okay. Which is uh, where they're having the Olympics in 2020. And nice. It's, I had actually ridden through there in 2009 because I did a, a ride from this bike race Kyoto Loco, this Alley Cat Kyoto Loco, to the CMW Seas in Tokyo. So we rode from Kyoto to Tokyo. And uh, that, that up there is also the uh, the Kyo, one of the Kirin universities. So it's like four massive velodromes and on top of like a crazy mountain on yeah. the peninsula with all the Kirin racers train. So it was cool because we were out there. I was out there in 2009 and then back out there again and was like, oh, my God, they built a beautiful indoor velodrome. Nice. Yeah, I just watched a documentary about that Kirin school and like, I don't know why I didn't know anything about it before. But what was that like just being in that atmosphere? <laughs> I mean, at the time it was because this was a 2009 too, so it was like kind of a while back. It was super cool. It was a, it was crazy for me because back then I, I mean I had raced on the track a handful of times, but I had never like I had never done anything that I'd never seen anything that serious. And like they, it's a very different culture out there. And like so far as that they made anyone with visible tattoos cover up their tattoos before he went to the Kieran school. And it was summertime, so it was like you know 90 degrees, and we're all bike messengers. So you can imagine everyone is just. I remember putting like my leg warm, my arm warmer on my leg to cover some leg tattoos, <laughs> and like you know it was. And but it was so amazing to watch these guys who were so very serious about something that we were not. You know, for us, track bikes was like fun and games and like skidding and like you know drinking beers and laughing and like whatever. But for these guys, it was obviously like the exact opposite. You know, it's like they live, breathe, eat, sleep, and shit at track bikes. And then when they go on, go on to racing, it's the stakes are super high. You know, they wear body armor. They like smash into each other and like, you know, going absurd, absurd speeds on like crazy gears. And so for us, it was, it was kind of cool to see the other side basically and be like, this is something that is great for you and you're super casual and it's fun. But like for some people, this is life and this is like a very serious thing. So I think it was at least good for me. That's how I took it. And we also, it was just a fantastic place to be, you know, it's like velodromes in the hills and they let us ride the big velodrome at sunset. And it was just one of those moments in life. You don't feel like I'm going to remember this forever. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a really cool experience for sure. Yeah, definitely uh, was. Um, do you want to talk about your art career a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I don't even know if I would call it a career. I think it's awesome that people like my art so much. I, I've always been one to doodle and uh, draw on things ever since I was a kid. And, you know, I got, into graffiti when I was in high school and I went to jail for graffiti right after I got out of high school and kind of was like, maybe I should stop drawing on people's things so I don't go back to jail. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, kind of always just kind of drew on stuff. And, you know, really what it was is a lot of the times, especially when I was first coming up, I uh, I would get a piece of equipment like a helmet or a pair of shoes and kind of just be like, this is cool, but this is boring. Like, you know, 10, 20 other people have this helmet in my city, you know, or like everyone has these shoes. And so I draw on them or like do something to make it like my own, make it, you know, kind of special to me. And then I was working as a messenger. I was work worked as a messenger for a long time. And at the time when I started racing and really drawing on shoes and stuff, I was working as a messenger full time. And I feel like I just always saw and heard so many cool things like, you know, uh, someone else's graffiti on a, on a lamppost, you know, or someone, someone wrote something in an elevator call box or, you know, you over here, somebody say something like somebody else in, in, on the street corner. And I just, I would always write it down in a little book, you know, or on the back of my hand. And, and my art now I think is kind of just how I not, and I don't want to use the word immortalized cause that sounds very like epic, but how I like keep track of and or remember all of these cool things that I've seen and heard, you know, cause I'm not going to go and be like, everything I write is, you know, unique to me. Like, I would say 95% of the quotes that are on any of my art are things that I've heard from other people or, you know, someone else's slogan or, you know, it's something else, that, something else that I've heard. But for me, it's just a way of taking something that inspires me or that I like, you know, think is really cool and keep putting it all in one place, you know, and being able to look at it and be like, yeah, do you take some risks, stay cutty, you know, PMA all day, eat pizza all day. You know, it's, I think it's just cool. And yeah, I'm, it blows me away that people, I'm super thankful that people, 
want to like wear my art and send me their shoes and their helmets and you know tell me to draw on them and even something like I, I've had done a couple pairs of integrals or handlebars which are you know super crazy rare and so someone's like hey you know paint strip the original Chinelli paint off and draw on this I'm just like so pumped that someone trusts me enough to do that and is not pumped on it and then the finished product I think looks really cool so when people get excited about it but yeah I don't know it's I don't really want to say it's a career because I I took something that I really loved which was riding a bike and I made it into a career and it's been really good. But if you take something you love to do for fun and turn it into something that you rely on for money, it can kind of change how you think about it. And I really like drawing for fun. So I don't really want to make it into something that I'm like trying to make a lot of money off of, you know, I'd rather just keep it accessible and do things like the kit and like other projects and collaborations with brands. But for me, I don't ever want it to become something that I'm like trying to hustle and like make money off of. You know, I just want to like stoke people out and you know produce some cool products and things like that, and ultimately keep it fun. So I kind of want to get into you own your own messenger company, right? Actually, just shut it down. Oh no! Uh, uh, I'll uh, I don't, right before Christmas. No, it's okay. I mean, it's yes. I ran, uh, I founded, and then ran a courier company called TCB Courier in San Francisco for eight and a half years. Um, I had a lot of really amazing business partners, some of which I'm still in business with today with other projects. Uh, and it was really good. You know, I think we, we got a really great time and a place in San Francisco. Um, and we worked our asses off, uh, and we just made something really amazing happen and we're able to get a lot of people jobs and inspire a lot of people to start career companies of their own around the country. Um, yeah, and it, it was a really good experience. You know, it was kind of bittersweet to see it close down, but at the same time I'd been doing it for eight and a half years and I was a messenger for six years before that. So I feel like I had done my time in the messenger community and I'm now <laughs> ready, ready to do something else. That being said, I still, um, we, uh, one of the companies I run with two of my other partners is a, um, logistics software company. So we provide kind of like a one-stop shop piece of software for local and independently owned courier companies so they can run their business, uh, food, food delivery and like normal messenger work. So That's still right. definitely very much involved in the community, but just not on the road anymore and not not the one running a courier company. But it work? was a very good time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Do you work with Confluence at all in Denver? Just uh, I do, yeah. Nice. Definitely, for sure. That's cool. They deliver my favorite pizza, so, you know, I'm always getting it from them. <laughs> yeah, Confluence, Confluence is rad. They're actually one of, the, one of the original partners and one of the original, like, courier company startups that kind of came uh, after TCB and – all the dudes that run it are, are really rad. Pumped on those guys. Yeah, for sure. I used to run a, uh, I used to own a little grocery store out here and, yeah. uh, kind of the same thing. I, I didn't shut it down. I just sold it to my partner like two years ago or something like that. Um, but when Confluence was starting, uh, we were like one of the first places they worked with. <laughs> so, so I was kind of like there at the beginning of those guys. So it's been cool to see them doing so well for themselves. For sure. Yeah, they definitely are killing it. Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of want to talk about um, 2018. What's it looking like for you? What kind of racing are you going to be doing? Projects you're working on? Um, you know, we're just right here in the new year. So yeah, 2018 is is going to be pretty ripping. I'm actually really excited about it. Um, I'm doing a lot more gravel races. Um, I've been kind of focusing on those the last couple years. And I've been really pumped on them. So a lot of gravel races on the calendar. Um, some of the ones I'm really excited about is the Land Run 100 in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Um, there's a local series called the Grasshopper Adventure Series. It does a five-race series um, outside of uh, Santa Rosa up in Occidental, California. The first one of those is this weekend, and they're, I think it's like the coolest race series in the world. They're like, they call them adventure races, so it's one of those things where like you never know what's the right bike to bring because you're going to do 40 miles on the road, but you're also going to do 30 miles of like crazy single track dirt. So yeah. a good time. Uh, but yeah, trying to just do a lot more things like that. There's the lost and found series uh, out in um, kind of the Eastern Sierras. It's really good. But um, really my big, my big thing this year as it was last year was the transcontinental race. Um, it's a race, it's a self-supported race across Europe. Uh, this is the sixth iteration of it. And it's, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> me and my friend Nico from Chicago, uh, we did it last year, kind of on a whim in a way. We got offered it um, very last minute by one of the sponsors who had sponsored Nico, and it's 
it's like something we've never done before, but it, it is in essence a large alley cat. Um, nice. You start in Belgium, they give you four checkpoints, uh, GPS coordinates to get to, um, spanning Europe, like all over, you know, you kind of zigzag your way across Europe. And other than making sure you're self-supported, uh, which is a big tenement of the race, you can't take help from anybody, you know, like catching a ride in a truck if your bike breaks down, like you need to be totally self-supported and uh, not riding through some of the band roads, like the crazy tunnels. You know, there's a couple of rules about not killing yourself on a highway. <laughs> it's kind of just up to you. You know, you route yourself and you decide if you want to ride for 20 hours or if you want to get some sleep or you sleep in a ditch, maybe you get a hotel. Like it's rad. You're just out there for days riding <laughs> yeah, i did my first double century and then i did like four other double centuries during that trip like you just go out and ride like 200 miles a day wow. you know and it's, i think for a lot of the europeans that race it it's, it's obviously still very crazy but to them it's like totally normal to wake up in one country ride through two other countries and then fall asleep in the fourth country but me and nico were just like blown away we were like you know, this is nuts. And they're like, it's just like the states back home. And we were like, no, no, no. The states back home don't have different languages and different currency and different cultures, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we we raced in the pairs category last year. Um, and we unfortunately actually had to scratch out of the race um, at the fourth checkpoint. So we basically did four out of the five stages because we had already committed to fly to Montreal for the Cycle Messenger World Championships. And it was our goal to complete the race in 13 days and then fly directly from Greece where the finish was to Montreal to race. But we had some routing mishaps mid-race uh, and it put us about a day behind schedule. So when we got to the fourth checkpoint um, on top of the Transfigar sand in Romania, which is this crazy mountain pass in Romania, we kind of did the math and realized that we weren't going to make our flights to Montreal if we continued. Like we just didn't have the time if we would have had to ride like 280 miles a day or something you know to finish on time um and we already had the tickets bought and i i self-supported myself i didn't have any sponsors for that race so and nico had a little bit of help but either way it was like super expensive and just kind of we would have missed world championships you know all this stuff to not go so we scratched which really bummed us out like we we were racing not to finish the race. We were racing for the adventure, but also at the same time, like we wanted to see the thing through. So this year, um, our, we're definitely finishing the entire race. And it's kind of like a redemption for us, as well as a great adventure and a great time. But we want to go back and uh, and finish the entire race and complete the whole TCR. And, you know, that's, I think, probably my biggest plan this year, um, other than going to China um, a bunch of times. I went to China for the first time a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, to work with the Hurricane Criterium. It's a series of criteriums out there in China that's just getting off the ground to kind of help them and bring Criterium racing to that community because in China, uh, they don't have kind of the opportunities, the same opportunities we have. They're not as connected to the world stage. So there's one organization, Hurricane Criterium, that's uh, really working to kind of bring crits. And they did one last year, and then this year they're going to do three. Um, so I'm going to probably go out for all three of those races and help people you know figure out how to raise criteriums and support and kind of get that community off the ground hell yeah that sounds awesome what's your uh current track bike setup currently i have five track bikes nice. <laughs> currently i have a problem yeah uh, let's talk about this is that i i just moved from a house with a huge garage to a house with a very tiny garage and so i i'm having some problems but uh i like to raise criteriums right now on the number 22 little wing um, one of the best bikes I've ever owned for Criterium racing and for pretty much everything else. Uh, you know, number 22 is a super small company out of New York that makes uh, titanium bikes. This bike specifically has a kind of a custom built Envy fork that they got Envy to build them, nice. which is rad. Uh, that's on my, on some... that's on my wish list at number 22. <laughs> Dude, it is, it is sweet. Um, and I'm, I'm supported by zip. So it's got a full zip, uh, I like the aluminum stuff personally, but a full zip aluminum uh, cockpit and seat post. Well, she doesn't have a seat post. It's a, got a seat mask. But And I'm racing on some 404s, clincher 404s. Um, and it, it rules. And I you know, I ride 20, 44RN chain rings. I've been riding those for a really long time. I think they're some of the best rings on the market. Um, Aaron, who makes them, is a super rad dude. And I got one as a prize for Super Bowl in like 2011. And I still ride that 47 tooth. And like the teeth profile hasn't changed in seven years like it's just like they're so well made it's crazy um and then that's my race bike and then i i ride around town on a, a mash tenure um the chinelli parallax mash tenure frame with some 
what I think is the coolest wheel slide ever. The guys at Zip may not think so, but Mash did a, a custom run of Philwood hubs to commemorate the uh, 10 year anniversary. Um, and they're 32 hole. And I got Zip to custom drill a set of 202s uh, to match the hubs and they laced them up. But the oxymoron for the guys at Zip is they were like, you're taking our lightest rim and you're putting 32 spokes on it and lacing it to like the heaviest track hub on the market. And I was like, yeah, but this is like the most bomb proof wheel set that I will have. I've had it for four years without, without ever a true, you know, and it's double fixed fills and not super flashy. You know, I'm not one for, I'm not ever going to ride like 808s, you know, I'm not trying to like be that flashy. So the 202s are a nice mix of like high performance carbon, but not blowing it in anyone's face. Yeah. Um, and I've got this really sick mash prototype rack that I've been stress testing. Uh, for Mike, that we're going to come out with some racks pretty soon. So I can tell you that the rack can very easily carry a five-gallon bucket of paint, which is, <laughs> I don't even know how heavy, but very heavy. And uh, I got some of those titanium uh, one-piece bars from Deluxe, the like one-piece straight bar combo, and yeah. it's fucking so cool. Yeah, it's like, Willis isn't super bummed that I'm going to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway because uh, I think it's rad. But they flex a little bit. You know, it's titanium. And, you know, I, I like them on a street bike because I'm not, I don't need stiff bars. You know, I don't need to have like full carbon stiffness to sprint to the stoplight. Yeah. But these bars, these bars are, uh, they, they flex just enough to make it comfortable. So I feel like they're like shock absorbers, especially on an aluminum frame with a carbon fork. I feel like they're rad. They very much smooth the ride out. And I, I really am a big fan. And, you know, I like the flex Willis. If you're listening to this, I think it's cool. So huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I uh, kind of feel like I, I need that. Cause I, I, we talk about it a lot on this podcast, but I love fixed gear climbing, so I'm always on rough roads and stuff. So, like, yeah, something that'll soak up that vibration. And I also like climbing better with straight bars. So, <laughs> yeah, me too. I I think I think that that's the jam. I think one of my favorite frames, and I'm, I won't talk about any more of them after this, but one of my favorite track frames that I own is a it's a, a, a Corex. It's a South Korean built Kirin frame. And I got from a buddy of mine. It's got Nagasawa lugs, Nagasawa bottom bracket. But he wrecked it a long time ago. So he got this local frame builder who's like very famous, Bernie Mickelson, to repair the top tube and the down tube. So this bike and the head tube. So this bike, the front of this bike is fillet braised, unpainted by this like local legend. And the rear of the bike is full Nagasawa, Kirin built, uh, lug steel. And then I've got a set of like track specific spinner G rev X's on it with a salsa, like an old school made in Petaluma salsa stem and some like super hoopty stray bars I found on the ground one time. But <laughs> it, it basically embodies the bike that I, when I started riding track bikes in like 2000, uh, 2005, it embodies the bike that I was, I wish I could have had. And I didn't have the money and I didn't have, you know, the means to get it. But basically a couple, two years ago, I got it, I got it together and I was like, I'm going to build the ultimate 2005 2006 like badass kieran bike you know and it's yes. now it's super flexy like you can't really skid on those wheels you probably shouldn't turn that fast on them it's like my like sunday bike but it's one of my favorites just because it represents like man this was the fucking coolest thing since sliced bread and now i have it <laughs> <laughs> nice that's fucking awesome that's like my next plan i think i want to build up my dream 2008 Kieran bike. <laughs> oh yeah, you get like a spin, get like a spin tri spoke for the front, get some like a chub hub laced to like a, a DV in the back, you know, like fuck yeah. Get some... I feel you, dude. I mean, <laughs> if you if you came up at the same time we did, then it's like you'll oh, fully yeah. appreciate that. Cause honestly, that stuff was really expensive when we came up. We like had no yeah. money. We were like grommets, you know. You ride the same tire till it literally falls off the rim. Now yep. you have a little bit of cash, and you're like, I'm gonna build the coolest bike from 2006. Exactly. One of my friends at the time, I don't know how she had the money, but she had like a Ganwell Pro with like aero spokes and like all this stuff. And I was always so jealous of that bike. So that's like my 2008 build. Except yeah, same, the same only same. thing I'm not going to bring over are the really small handlebars. Never dug yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, even even these hoopty straight bars I have are like as wide as my shoulders. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Give me really wide bars. That's what I need. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm yeah. Um, <laughs> so, can you say anything or talk about anything of the Chinelli Mash collaborations for 2018? Well, Chinelli and Mash are no longer working together as of 2016. So oh. that actually ended a while back. Um, oh wow! Yeah, they 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 split their partnership up in 2016. I actually left Chinelli a little bit before that um, for some personal reasons, but. 
uh, MASH is coming out with its own line of bikes. Oh, uh, that's what I saw. Yeah, so it's it's similar to the work frame because we – the chili work frame because we designed the work frame, you know, and uh, – we basically there's a couple things that we didn't get to do with the with Chinelli uh, for various production reasons, and so the work frame that Mash is coming out with in March is basically like our perfect work frame, and it's nice. everything we wanted, like no corners cut. Because um, when you we're we're going to be doing very limited runs, and they are still built um, in Taiwan, but um, you know it's a very it's actually I think it's the same builder that builds the Chinelli frame, so the, the level of welding is fantastic. But we have a proprietary tube set. And, uh, you know, we basically all the things that we didn't get to do because we had to deal with like massive production runs and, you know, kind of the bigger, bigger corporate side of the cycling industry. Yeah. We're going to do we're going to do it basically our way and do it right. So Fuck yeah. um, that's coming out. There's a work frame, a steel work frame coming out in March. There's an aluminum uh, track frame, a little more geared towards criterium racing than not, but still very much a street shredder uh, coming out in August. And then in the works, prototyping. We prototyped those two frames last year. This year, we're prototyping uh, a single speed cross bike uh, through axle that is also going to be available, I believe, to have a geared option. So, kind of like a do all bike. And then potentially also an aluminum road frame. So, uh, MASH is producing bikes for MASH, tested by MASH for all of you guys to shred. So keep an eye out for that for sure. Fuck yeah. I guess I'm going to have to wait till August to get a new track frame. <laughs> I, I would recommend it. I actually just went out filming today on the aluminum track frame and it, it, it's pretty ripping. I, I really, I really enjoyed it. So to say. Cool. So I know you have to go soon. Uh, though there were still a bunch of questions I wanted to ask. So maybe one day you'll have to come back on, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Is there anything that you want to say? Anything you want to shout out your sponsors, uh, any of that kind of stuff? And yeah, any words of wisdom for people that are going to start racing fixed gear crits and stuff this summer? Yeah. I mean, I'd like to shout out Steve Blick and Oakley. They've been a huge fan for a long time and a big supporter. Obviously, Mike and MASH. Um, Dustin at Cadence. There's a bajillion other ones. Santa Cruz, number 22. Andrew Lowe, who builds some fantastic aluminum bike frames. I'll be racing his bike across Europe in a couple months again. Um, and everybody else. There's a ton of other support. Chuck at Jiro. Uh, you know, people that keep me going. I really appreciate it. It means more to me than you know, coming from somebody who had nothing to uh, be supported by all these fantastic brands. But I mean, really, I just want to tell people that they should keep it fun, you know, train, be serious, but ultimately remember that you're just racing bikes and or riding bikes and it should always be enjoyable. Um, keep keep the rubber side down. You know, you got to finish the race to win the race. Don't you should ride fast and take chances, but don't don't do anything overly stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be able to finish the race to win the race is a good a good quote. Um, I love that. Yeah, but really, I mean, if you're trying to get into racing fixed gear crits, I think one of the best things you can do is start to ride with other people. You know, there's a lot of group rides uh, happen in every town, and as much as some people may be averse to riding with like roadies, so to say. You know, riding with groups of other people really teaches you how to handle yourself in a pack. And uh, riding and fixing your crits is a lot about handling yourself with others and being safe, but also, you know, making moves. So trying to ride with other people and just and ask questions. You know, it's a scary thing to start, and people are always intimidated because they're gonna, you know, look like the new guy or they're gonna do something dumb. But I can tell you from personal experience that it's much better to look dumb and ask a question than to actually do something stupid in a race and cause a wreck or cause someone else to get hurt because you didn't want to ask a question. So just always don't be afraid to speak up and, you know, be vocal. And if you have any questions, you can email me, not really Chaz at gmail.com um, or hit me up on the DM and ask any questions. I'm more than happy to answer even the stupidest mundane question about pretty much anything. Um, I got where I am because a few select people really helped me and let me pick their brains and answer questions. So I'm fully available to anybody that wants to ask me what's up or do, you know, even if you just want to talk about your favorite food, unless I'm super busy, I'll probably respond. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, just keep the rubber side down and keep it fun. You know, remember that it's all about being stoked and sharing your stoke with other people. Cool, man. And where can people find you on like your social media and stuff? Well, I only do the Instagram. I don't have a Facebook or Snapchat or anything, but Same not here. Chaz. Uh, yeah. <laughs> not Chaz on Instagram. Uh, so that's pretty much the only place to find me. But like I said, not really Chaz at gmail.com. Uh, if you wanted to shoot me an email or drop me a line or you can slide into the old DM if you like it, like it better that way. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm totally available. I, I think one of the big things that I want to leave with is that 
I am 100% just a normal, everyday, average dude. So if you want to talk to me, just talk to me like a normal person because we're all just riding bikes. It's nothing fancy and nothing special. Yeah, fuck yeah. Cool, Chaz. Uh, thanks yeah, for man, doing thanks this, for talking. man. Yeah. Sorry about the interruption. Well, hopefully my car won't slide down the road again. You're all good. We had like five. <laughs> we had like five interruptions. So. I know, but I think it'll it'll make for a funny podcast because it'll it'll you know it's not there's not a super great flow to it, but you know we got to like take a fresh start five times. Yeah, you know. Well, that's what they make editing for. So. <laughs> exactly. Right on. Well, I got to get to band practice. Cool. So have I'll fun, check man. In later. Thanks yeah, a lot. Take it easy. All right, that does it for another episode of Save the Track Bike. Thank you so much for tuning in. Subscribe, tell your friends about this podcast. Yeah, go to savethetrackbike.com. Hit me up on Instagram, at Save the Track Bike. This episode's produced by David Draper. The music's by Vitamin Pets. Go ride whatever bike you want, wherever you want. 